So, good morning. My name is Neil Ray, and um, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist practicing at a children's hospital, and over half of my practice is pediatric anesthesia. And one of the things I get to do um, on a weekly basis is work with hemonc patients, and I've gotten to know our hematologist, oncologist, and I want to share some of my learnings from the hemonc arena um, that I think are very relevant to your OB practice. I do have a financial disclosure to make. I'm involved with a startup called Radiant Oximetry. We're developing non-invasive fetal monitors for labor and delivery, and hopefully in a couple of years I'll be exhibiting instead of presenting. So I thought I would start off with three case reports. The, fir two, the first two case reports I personally did not experience, but I drew from the literature. This first case report involves a 27-year-old pregnant woman who had a heart transplant when she was 10 for cardiomyopathy. Her pregnancy was uncomplicated, um, and she had an uncomplicated post-transplant course that was free from rejection and infection. However, three months postpartum, her rejection fraction dropped from 58% to 25%, and five months later, she required a second heart transplant. What happened to this woman? And I can tell you it wasn't postpartum cardiomyopathy. The next case I want to present is an elderly woman who presented to the OR for pelvic tumor de debulking. She had an osteosarcoma of her pelvis. She had a history of pregnancy times two, um, 15 years before she was diagnosed with cancer. She received one unit of non leuka reduced blood cells 12 days before surgery for presumably having some anemia. Her preoperative platelet count was 351,000, but intra-op, her course was complicated by massive blood loss, which required um, transfusion support. She had a platelet count of 49,000, during the procedure, and she was given 12 units of platelets. However, the platelet count didn't go up. She received another 24 units of platelets as her platelet count was falling down to 20,000, and the highest platelet count that they were able to get after 36 units of platelets was 36,000. She was diagnosed with a condition called alloimmune platelet refractoriness and subsequently expired. And then this third case I want to present is a newborn baby that was born at term with IVH and thrombocytopenia. This baby, th this mother had a healthy pregnancy and a full-term newborn that was born with petechiae and bruises. When they did a workup of the baby, the CBC revealed a platelet count of 20,000, but the hematocrit and the WBC count was normal. So from all these three cases, what do they have to do with OB anesthesia in our practice? And there's, there's a theme here that we will be talking about. So my objectives today are to talk about um, the HLA antigen system, risk factors for forming HLA antibodies, the implications of pregnancy and HLA antibody formation, and the strategies that you and I can employ to reduce HLA antigen exposure to our patients. So we're all very familiar with ABO system, RH, but we don't really talk about the HLA system. And there are three classes of HLA um, antigens in our body, and they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. The only cells in our body that don't have the HLA system are red blood cells, and the trophoblasts that surround the placenta. Every other part of our body has these HLAs, and if you get exposed to them, you will form antibodies. But the question is, what are the implications of the antibodies? So some of the common causes of HLA allosensitization involve transfusion of blood products, transplantation of organs, pregnancy, even the influenza vaccine. Are your hospitals requiring that you get the influenza vaccine? Same here. And have you ever heard of a patient that said, I got the vaccine, but it didn't work? Well, there's some truth to that. Um, there are patients that have HLA antibodies 
and when they get influenza vaccine, that vaccine will be destroyed and they never have a chance to uh, form a proper immune response. Heart valve allografts have also been known to cause HLA allosensitization and um, LVADs, such as the HeartMate 1, can cause HLA allosensitization. It's a big problem for patients that are on the cardiac transplant list, getting these um, that are supported with an LVAD and then they get these antibodies that complicate their post-transplant course. So when you look at the incidence of HLA allosensitization, female patients that have multiple pregnancy are at high risk for developing this. I want to start off with the bottom patient, a male patient who is awaiting a kidney transplant and has a history of multiple blood cell transfusions. Their risk of developing this is only about 16%. But a healthy woman who's had four or more pregnancies her risk is up to 32%. So this is pretty prevalent. And when you, when you form HLA antibodies and you're allosensitized, the risks that are posed to you involve platelet refractoriness, miscarriages, rejection of a pot potential transplanted organ, transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease, and trolley. I wanted to briefly mention a little bit about trolley because as anesthesiologists, we're very familiar with it. For a long time, we didn't know what caused trolley and what the pathophysiology of it was. But since 2009, we've had a better understanding. Trolley is now thought to be a result from donor blood that contains HLA antibodies and they react with the white blood cells in the recipient and that complex gets, um, gets embedded into the lungs and causes an acute inflammatory reaction. Since 2009, we've been, the American Red Cross and different blood banks around the world have changed the way that they screen donors for blood, for blood donation. So now if you, you're a woman and you've, you've had two or more pregnancies, uh, your blood will be collected and, and noted and, and, and administered differently for certain populations. And that practice has decreased the incidence of trolley from one in 4,000 to one in 12,000. So what can we as anesthesiologists do to avoid our patients getting exposure to HLA antigens. Some of the ideas that I'd like to throw around are considering twice before giving a blood transfusion, especially in the setting of gestational thrombocytopenia when the platelet count is below 100,000. Or how about that healthy pregnant woman whose hemoglobin is somewhere between eight and 10? Does she really need a blood transfusion? If you do have to give a blood transfusion, consider giving LUCA-reduced blood transfusion. We always give ABO-compatible red blood cells, but have you ever given an HLA-compatible red blood cell transfusion? And often platelets, when they're transfused, are ABO-incompatible. Now, I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit, but we can consider giving ABO-compatible um, platelets and HLA-compatible platelets. And then often the platelets we give are pooled from multiple donors. They can involve six to eight donors. There is an option to give single donor platelets. And there's a collection method called apheresis, um, which gives better platelet qualities and reduces HLA exposure. I want to talk a little bit about what is a safe platelet count for neuroaxial anesthesia and parturients, since this is an OB anesthesia meeting. I love this quote from Dr. Goodyear, who said, the unknown risk of hematoma continues to justify the decision to avoid neuroaxial anesthesia and thrombocytic parturients. And we end up unnecessarily sometimes exposing the mother and fetus to either general anesthesia or a platelet transfusion. Dr. Goodyear in 2015 published an article on anesthesia and analgesia where he reviewed 499 patients that had platelet counts above 50,000 
and they received neuroaxial anesthesia and there are no complications. And then 2016, Bernstein presented 256, or 256 patients with platelet counts over 50,000 and there are no complications. Recently, the American Association of Blood Bank changed their guidelines for prophylactic platelet transfusions for elected lumbar punctures to where they are no longer needed for platelet counts above 50,000. But how many of us are doing spinal taps in women with platelet counts over 50,000? Few of us, okay, good to see. Since I am a pediatric anesthesiologist and I spend a lot of time in HEMOC, I wanted to show some of this literature from the HEMOC experience. This is a case series of 5,000 children from St. Jude's Children's Hospital who received prophylactic, not therapeutic, but prophylactic lumbar punctures to prevent ne neurological spread of ALL. And most of these kids had platelet counts below 100,000. In fact, where's the pointer? If you look at that top row, I hope everyone can see it. There are six LPs performed for kids that had platelet counts five and under. There are, 20, there are 23 LPs performed for kids that had LPs or that had platelet counts that were 10 and under. I'm not necessarily advocating that we do spinals for platelet counts that are this low, but we should be aware of the experience from the HEMONC literature and how low they can go and they haven't seen complications. And in um, HEMONC, they will not transfuse a child if the platelet count is above 10,000 for a prophylactic lumbar puncture. I would encourage you guys all to, when you get home, to ask your blood bank what are their practices for platelet collection. Do they do apheresis or do they collect whole blood? Is that whole blood separated and then pooled? And if it is pooled, how many donors are they pooling? Are they doing six? Are they doing eight? Are they doing ABO compatible platelet transfusion? Do you have the option of giving HLA matching for platelet transfusions? And will they do leukoreduction reduction or are you expected to do leukoreduction? reduction? A little bit about ABO incompatible platelets. You can give them, but you have to give more to get the same effect as if you were to give ABO compatible platelets. So most institutions will give ABO incompatible platelets because the shelf life of platelets is so short, five to seven days, and they don't want them to go to waste. So their feeling is you're better off giving them to the patient and not wasting them and not having a shortage of platelets for future patients. Since 2010, there's been a new technique for collection of blood called apheresis. It's kind of like dialysis where it takes three to four hours and um, you can collect the exact component that you need and you can collect more of it. So it allows donors to give just platelets and they can give platelets more often and the quality of platelets are higher and it's only gonna expose the patient to one antigen source versus pooled antigen source. And when you can only give blood six times a year, you can do donor, donations through apheresis 24 times a year. I think I just talked about this, ABO matching and platelet transfusions. So if you ever encounter a patient that does have platelet refractoriness, like that second case we talked about, what can you do in the OR to deal with that situation? Sometimes blood banks can give you HLA matched platelets, but if you can't get those, then and you're forced to give um, HLA non-matched platelets, you can consider giving ABO compatible platelets. And if you can't give ABO compatible platelets, if you give enough of ABO incompatible platelets, you should be able to get the platelet count to go up. There's also a role for IV gamma globin to 
respond to the HLA antibodies, and plasmapheresis is also a, an effort to um, increase the platelet count. So if we go back to those case reports that I mentioned earlier, the first case report of the 27-year-old woman who had a heart transplant and required a second heart transplant post-pregnancy, she developed HLA class two antigens from the fetus, which was inherited from the father. And these antibodies attacked her transplanted heart and she required a second transplant. And you can imagine when you require a second heart transplant, the surgery is gonna be more complicated. It's gonna require a second sternotomy and any blood products that you give have to match now the second new set of HLA antigens. That second case report that I started off with, with the female patient presenting to the OR for pelvic tumor debulking, she was confirmed to have HLA antibodies, and they were presumed to be a result from either pregnancy, fetal HLA antigens, or HLA antigens that were present on the red white blood cells from that non leuka reduced um, transfusion that she received. Her HLA antibody level were observed to increase following the repeated transfusions of incompatible platelets that she received. And such transfusions actually worsen platelet refractoriness by further stimulating allosensitization. And like I mentioned earlier, that patient expired eight days after the procedure. And how about that newborn baby that was born at term with IVH and thrombocytopenia? That baby had a condition called neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. That was a result of maternal antibodies to fetal HLA antigens on the platelets of the fetus. And half of those came from the father as well. There's also another system in addition to the HLA antibodies or antigens called the HPA antigens, human platelet antigens that can cause um, neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. One thing to remember is IgG antibodies can cross the placenta and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia doesn't occur with the first pregnancy but often with the second or third. And any woman that has a history of neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia has over an 80% chance that subsequent pregnancies will be complicated by this. In terms of human platelet antigens, 98% of the population is HPA1 positive, but 2% of the population is HPA negative. So a postpartum woman has about a one in 350 chance of developing these HPA antibodies. And if a woman, if you know of a woman that has this and is pregnant, IVIG may have a role in preventing IVH for future pregnancies. So a couple final thoughts. I'd encourage you to consult your local blood bank to learn about how platelets are collected at your institution. I would work with your transfusion committee to develop mitigation strategies to reduce HLA allosensitization in your patients. And I would ask you to incorporate HLA allosensitization into your risk benefit analysis when you're considering a transfusion for that patient. And if you ever encounter a patient that's bleeding and the platelet count is not going up after a platelet transfusion, consider platelet refractoriness and changing the type of platelets that you're administering. Thank you.